The Scopes Monkey Trial of 1925, in which John T. Scopes was prosecuted for teaching the theory of evolution to his high school biology class, was a setting for the debate between supporters of fundamentalism and supporters of science. On the surface, the purpose of the trial was to determine whether or not John Scopes had broken the law set in place by the Butler Act. However, it soon became evident that the law was not the main interest of the people following the proceedings. Two of the most famous lawyers in America did not travel to Tennessee to become involved in a minor dispute in which only a small fine was at stake. The Scopes trial captured the nation's attention because it was about something more than the law. John Scopes was not truly the one on trial. Freedom was on trial. So, how did the so-called trial of the century come to pass? It all started as a sort of publicity stunt designed to bring tourism to Dayton. A group of local conspirators heard that the American Civil Liberties Union was willing to provide their services to anyone who would challenge the recent Butler Act of 1925, which declared that teaching Charles Darwin's theory of evolution in the classroom was illegal. The conspirators approached John Scopes, a high school biology teacher from Dayton. They asked him if he would take part in a test case by knowingly breaking the law. He agreed, and after teaching evolution in class, seven of his students indicted him. Uh, I grew up in uh, East Tennessee in Ray County. Ray County is the county uh, in which the Scopes Monkey Trial was held in 1925. I graduated in 1960, so this was during the 1950s that I would have had, late 50s, I would have taken this class. I had really actually a, a pretty decent uh, biology teacher, but it was sort of controversial, and you could read the chapters that had to do with uh, an orderly progression of plant life, growing complexity, and specialization that you sort of knew had something to do with natural selection as well as uh, uh, lower forms of animals. But there was a chapter on um, evolution and Darwinism that sort of brought it together. We were not required to read this chapter. The teacher probably said something to the effect that there's sort of a different version of the stories in the book of Genesis and the Bible. It was an interesting thing in the sense that we were sitting right there on the, not the same building, but the, the same school where the uh, incident that presumably incident uh, presumably occurred that prompted the, uh, the Scopes trial. As the trial date approached, the jury and lawyers were selected. For the defense, Clarence Darrow, a nationally renowned defense attorney. He was primarily a defense attorney um, for um, any number of high-profile criminal cases when outlandish murders or kidnappings had occurred brutal murders, he would sometimes move in and defend these very unpopular uh, defendants. When the ACLU was searching for someone to defend John Scopes, Darrow was far from their first choice. Science fiction writer H.G. Wells was offered the job, along with former presidential candidates John W. Davies and Charles Evan Hughes, but all of them turned it down. Opposing Darrow was the prosecuting attorney, three-time presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan. Darrow and Bryan had radically different styles and viewpoints. Darrow was fond of taking difficult and unpopular cases, and he was a firm agnostic. His speaking technique was not as flashy or sophisticated as Bryan's, but he could certainly get the job done. There's a cause for all sorts of human conduct, just exactly as there's a cause for all the physical action of the universe. In contrast with Darrow, Bryan was famed for his rhetorical prowess. He was an extremely popular politician in the early 1900s, and he gave numerous important speeches during his career. The Cross of Gold speech was perhaps his most well-known. I come to speak to you in defense of a cause as holy as the cause of liberty, the cause of humanity. Mr. Carlyle said in 1878 that this was a struggle between the idle holders of idle capital and the struggling masses who produce the wealth and pay the taxes of the country. With Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan signed on to take part, the Scopes trial was suddenly thrust onto the national stage. Traditional values were suddenly in direct conflict with modern science. Fundamentalist religion was being put on trial against the theory of evolution, and America was a rapt audience. People from all over flooded into the small town of Dayton. 
and the locals were immediately characterized by the media. There was a lot of stereotyping of fundamentalists in a negative way coming out of the Scopes trial. And that, I think, misled a whole bunch of people, including the evolutionists, to, to underestimate the tenacity of the certain uh, religious beliefs. Even the people in Ray County have bought into the stereotype of themselves. A number of the reporters were rude and dismissive and looked for a colorful story about ignoramuses or local behaviors or spitting on the sidewalk. Yeah, it happened. So, why not? On the first day of the trial, nearly a thousand people jammed into the Ray County Courthouse. The atmosphere was carnival-like. The streets of Dayton, Tennessee were filled with adamant supporters from both sides. Evolutionists brought chimpanzees, claiming that they were going to testify for the prosecution, while the Anti-Evolution League sold literature promoting fundamentalism. The battle had begun. On July 10, 1925, the first day of the trial, the defense made it known that their goal was not to have Scopes acquitted, but rather to get the case moved to a higher court. Right off the bat, the proceedings in the courtroom were not directly related to the issue of whether or not Scopes had taught evolution to his biology class. Darrow and Brian were obviously trying to sway the people of America in their favor, not the jury. The defense's first witness was zoology professor Maynard Metcalf. Calling Metcalf as a witness exemplified the overarching mood of the trial. Obviously, Metcalf could not offer any evidence in support or opposition of the question at hand. He was merely called to state that evolution is true. The prosecution, perhaps legitimately, argued that Metcalf's testimony was irrelevant. The judge presiding over the court, John T. Ralston, ruled that the defense should not be allowed to call expert witnesses. Despite this decision, Brian and Darrow both continued to treat the case not in a legal sense, but more as a battle between ideologies. This battle came to a head when, on July 20th, Darrow called Brian to the stand as a witness. Their debate was seen by thousands of people on the courthouse lawn. Court proceedings had been moved outside due to the stifling summer heat and the sheer volume of people in attendance. You have given considerable study to the Bible, haven't you, Mr. Bryan? Yes, sir. I have tried to. Then you have made a general study of it. Yes, I have. I have studied the Bible for about 50 years, or sometime more than that. But, of course, I have studied it more as I have become older than when I was but a boy. You claim that everything in the Bible should be literally interpreted. I believe everything in the Bible should be accepted as it is given there. Some of the Bible is given illustratively. For instance, ye are the salt of the earth, would not insist that man was actually salt, or that he had flesh of salt, but it is used in the sense of salt as saving God's people. But when you read that Jonah swallowed the whale, or, or that the whale swallowed Jonah, excuse me please, how do you literally interpret that? When I read that a big fish swallowed Jonah, it does not say whale. That is my recollection of it. A big fish, and I believe it, and I believe in a god who can make a whale and can make a man and can make both what he pleases. Now, you say the big fish swallowed Jonah, and he there remained how long? Three days? And then he spewed him upon the land. You believe that the big fish was made to swallow Jonah? I am not prepared to say that. The Bible merely says it was done. Later in the interrogation, both lawyers finally brought their arguments out into the open. They did not come here to try this case. They came here to try revealed religion. I am here to defend it, and they can ask me any question they please. Both men became quite impassioned, with Darrow eventually saying, You insult every man of science and learning in the world because he does not believe in your fool religion. In the end, John Scopes was convicted and sentenced to a fine of $100. The trial of the century came to an anticlimactic conclusion, but the debate between science and religion continues to this day. In Riverton, Wyoming, one high school biology teacher faces the conflict between a personal belief in God and the teachings of modern science. I'm a six-day creationist, that God created um, the universe and all the things that were in it, and then set that in motion. Now that doesn't mean that I don't believe that things certainly changed. The organisms that we have uh, today in 2011 are clearly not what's in the fossil record. So in terms of faith meeting evolution, I don't have a problem talking about evolution. It doesn't threaten me, it doesn't threaten my faith, and I don't mind students talking about it either. The Scopes trial has many layers. At first glance, it is merely a case concerning a man who broke the law. Beneath that is the underlying debate between fundamentalism and science. And beneath that debate is the essential importance of the freedom to believe what you want to believe and the freedom to hear all viewpoints and for all viewpoints to be expressed.